Okay. Good. Okay, that's fine. We're recording. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Joshua, we are going to start. So, uh, welcome everybody to this edition of our seminar on modeling of COVID-19. It is a pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker for today. Is he is uh, Professor Joshua Bites from the Georgia. Uh, Techno Technological Institute, I think is the full name, Georgia Tech. Uh, he is the founder director of the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Quantitative Biosciences, which is a graduate program directed to mathematical biology in all and a high, a large diversity of fields. In particular, he has worked in epidemiology, evolutionary theory, and many, many other things. He uh, was elected fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science three years ago. He graduated as physicist from the MIT. And as I say, he's now in Georgia Tech. He's besides an excellent uh, researcher and uh, has work, been working in COVID since the start of the epidemic. He also is a very outspoken uh, researcher, leader uh, on, on opinion in, in Georgia Tech in Atlanta, I guess, uh, with, uh, uh, and has also uh, designed very practical things like this uh, dashboard for risk assessment in the different counties in the United States. And I understand now it's been extended to the United Kingdom and France. And so we have a speaker that is very much involved with uh, COVID-19 in many of the aspects that this disease has from the theoretical to the very practical. And it's a pleasure to have you, Joshua. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we are going to start. This is, uh, as, as I always say, the opinions of the speaker are his own and not necessarily reflect the opinions or point of view of the National University, nor the project that we are uh, is sponsoring this, this seminar. And this is an academic seminar, so we request in the interaction with our guests, uh, respect and of course, uh, academic interchange. So with much uh, more, not more to say, uh, Joshua, please, uh, the screen is yours and thank you very much for being with us. <clears throat> okay. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación, Jorge. Uh, voy a empezar con un poquito de español. Mi esposa es de Argentina, así voy a tratar de hablar un poquito en castellano, como ella dice. Y también a decir que sí, yo soy director de este programa de QBIOS. Es un programa de PhD eh, que hace ya cinco años que fundamos este programa. Y eh, todavía estamos buscando más estudiantes que quieren empezar un programa en la intersección entre biología, matemática, computación, y si quieren uh, uh, aprender más, a ese sitio de web qbios.gatech.edu. Y, ok, ya terminé mi español porque va a ser difícil hacer esta presentación. Y también si ese grupo no es tan grande, así ponemos, si hay preguntas uh, mientras yo estoy hablando, así pueden, um, hacen sus preguntas, no sé si están en mudo o no, ese no entiendo. Uh, ¿Cómo funciona? Sí, sí. Ajá. Eh, como tú desees, Joshua, podemos darle el micrófono a quien quiera que pueda quiera claro. participar. Sí. Solo, sí. Si, si, si quiere, vos puedes avisarme si hay preguntas. Uh, Muy bien. Durante Muy eso. bueno tu español. Muy bueno. Gracias, Luis. Gracias. Voy a tratar. Ok, but the rest will be in English. Just because otherwise it'll get confusing. And I will also try to put my laser pointer on. So uh, as Jorge mentioned, I'll be talking about COVID-19 today. And just before I begin, I want to point out that everything we're doing goes on MedArchive or BioArchive or sometimes Archive, depending on the focus. And also to point out that this risk assessment dashboard is available. It focuses on United States risk, but has recently been expanded to include uh, risk assessment in Europe as well. So in case you're interested, feel free to check out these links or afterwards you can ping me via Jorge to learn more. And also before I begin, it's important that I recognize and acknowledge the support of various funding agencies which have made this possible. And as you all know, often it wasn't what we were working on uh, in the even narrow sense, but certainly in the broad sense, we had been working on epidemic dynamics for a while, but really focusing on virus microdynamics and graciously many of these funding organizations have been supportive of our efforts to shift and really do, frankly, a third shift of work here to try to support COVID-19 modeling. And it's been an interdisciplinary effort, both within my group, but also with collaborators at Georgia Tech and more broadly. 
So I just want to put things in perspective. I don't think this is a surprise for many of you, but I realize people come from different audiences that throughout this epidemic, there's been questions raised having to do with the basic reproductive number, as well as the difference between the case fatality and this infection fatality rate. And at the very outset, this is a New York Times article back in February, there was some uncertainty. I think we have a little bit more uncertainty, more certainty now that R0 is something about three and the infection fatality rate is a little bit less than 1% and very strongly obviously with age. So a population's IFR may differ depending on its age distribution. And we've also been asking this question, how can we evaluate the value of responses? How should we value one particular non-pharmaceutical intervention over others? And that really is because for a very long time, we understood that the pharmaceutical interventions were not yet available and would be a long time in coming. That is still the case now. And I wanna raise this interesting point that the question of this r naught estimation has been one that's been key from the outset because if we understand r naught, we might understand our effective and the value of interventions. And it's actually a hard problem. So here I've given us an example of a stochastic outbreak that I've shown with the simulation. I can assure you that the R naught here is 1.5. And this next panel, I have another simulation. I can assure you the R naught is two. And then this third one, it's 2.5. And I think you will notice that these are uncannily similar because at early stages, in fact, all three of these curves overlay precisely on top of one another even though, as you can tell, they begin to diverge in terms of the peak incidence as well as the long-term size of the epidemic. And I just wanna point out from the beginning, if I use terms like speed, strength, and size, this is what I mean, that we're often observing things like the speed, the number of new cases. And for various things, reasons, we'd like to know the strength, the r naught, which tells us this threshold criteria, but also how many new cases are caused by every infectious case at the beginning, because it's the strength that tells us something about this size, right? So we have what we measure, but we have obviously an identifiability problem. Many values of R0 can be compatible with the same observed rate of increase, even if the outbreak sizes are different. So these illustrations, now that we have some constraint, the link between speed, and strength has to do with generation intervals, a topic for another day. But given that we know more about these generation intervals, it's possible to then connect these ideas and why, therefore, thinking about modeling control matters. This is early work by the Imperial College of London, which goes back really to strength size relationships. That if we take something like a respiratory disease with an R naught of 2.5 or maybe 3, we may get above 50% infected. There's a strong and uh, I think worthwhile debate uh, having to do with exactly how heterogeneity may affect things. And if we had more time, I could talk about this controversy of herd immunity. But I think it's very clear that whatsoever the impacts are at the large scale, that within small scale environments, there's nothing that stops COVID-19 from infecting 20% of people. Let me assure you that at Georgia Tech, in certain fraternity houses, we have more than 50% infected. Many examples, in the small scale of nursing homes, of cruise ships, of fraternity houses, in which you can get a significant fraction, well above 50% infected. So if we apply that to the population, we take a large population with many infected and an IFR somewhere between 0.5 and 1%, you can see why there are these dire forecasts of a million plus fatalities in a country the size of the United States. Then of course the reaction has been to have large scale lockdowns. And now these interventions are certainly have had positive benefits with respect to deaths averted. This is early reports again out of Imperial College of London in March, published in Nature in June, estimating tens of thousands of averted fatalities. But there's a consequence and cost to that, which is that it's not only the case that you can have averted peaks because of extrinsic factors, but also because of changes in behavior. And I'll just allude to the fact that very early on in May, we put together a small model showing that if you have awareness of fatalities that acts as a negative feedback on transmission, it's possible to get peaks in fatalities that have nothing to do with susceptible depletion, but altogether to do with the awareness of the spread and severity of COVID-19. And as that awareness drops because 
cases and fatalities decrease, you can end up seeing second waves and even third waves in terms of cases and fatalities. And the strength of those really depend on whether or not that awareness is converted to long-term changes in behavior. And I'll just point this out uh, again as a means to show that both exogenous and endogenous factors may modify uh, the long-term dynamics of COVID-19. This has also led, I think, to tension. We've been thinking about either or scenarios. Are we flattening the curve, meaning are we focusing on public health, or are we fostering economic engagement? And the problem with this either or scenario is that we really need to be doing both. And the problem with en masse lockdowns, they focus on one hand, just trying to control public health. And as you probably aware in the United States and other places, including UK, have been talking about herd immunity as a strategy, which would sacrifice large numbers of individuals with severe consequences, ostensibly to foster economic engagement. But there's not really a good way to have economic engagement with large scale infections, fatalities, breakdowns of hospitals, and so on. So we're trying to think, and I'll try to focus on today, is to break through this dichotomous outlook and find third paths through. So I'll try to talk today about a few ideas. How could we use modification of behaviors, but also really testing and tracing to identify individual disease status and therefore do something about COVID-19 that doesn't necessarily involve large-scale lockdowns? I'll do this in a few parts. First of all, I'll talk specifically about viral testing using a particular example from our own institute, Georgia Tech, as an example conceptually and practically of how I think viral testing can be used as a form of mitigation. And then I will talk also how that relates to contact tracing, but more broadly, how testing not only for virus, but also for antibodies using serological testing can also be a potential means of trying to mitigate and control the spread of disease, not just as a passive indicator of where things are. And in doing so, I will try then to put all these ideas together in part three to try to talk about a policy approach and using control theoretic methods to try to talk really about ways that individualized testing policies may be able to support both health and economic outcomes. So again, I'll try to do this in three parts, viral testing, serotesting, and then talk about the implications for policy. Okay, so let me begin with the viral testing side. And hopefully you all can still hear me because as you know, when you, you give these talks, everyone, I'm in a vacuum. So if, if something goes on, okay, thank you. I'm, you're still there and you can still hear me, good. So let me recall now the, the conditions for epidemic growth, which you all, particularly this audience are familiar with is the product of the infections per time times the infectious period, where the infections per time is itself a product of contacts by infectious individuals per time, the probability those contacts are with the susceptible, and the probability that that contact transmits the disease. As a result, this also suggests opportunities for control. Each one of these factors you could think of somehow reducing and therefore reducing or not and leading to at least in the near term control and potentially even in the long term. These include hospitalization and treatment if that were available, but critically, if you wanna reduce contacts by infectious individuals, it would be good to test and then identify infectious individuals and isolate them so they had fewer contacts. Of course, if those people are moving around, finding online equivalents, distancing can help. And finally, as a last resort, that's where masks come in and other forms of process engineering. So this is a simplified representation of how testing can be used. You're all familiar, I hope, with these SEIR-like models in which interactions between infectious and susceptible individuals lead to exposed individuals, which just then transition to infectious individuals. But critically, this R could be recovered or removed. And our intention here is to try to remove individuals from circulation by testing them and isolating them and thereby reducing the potential force of infection. Just by focusing on one component of the system, if I were to look at the change of infectious individuals with time, there'll be new individuals who become infectious because they pass through this incubation period. Some will recover, 
but we can remove some through testing, where we have a rate of testing and also our sensitivity. And therefore, we can essentially reduce the infectious impact by this factor where the removal rate due to testing competes with the natural recovery period. And the higher we make this rate of testing and sensitivity, the better we are at essentially having people move from I to R because of the testing process rather than through the natural etiology of the disease. And that idea essentially means that speed matters. Testing frequency can be very effective as other people have mentioned with respect to rapid testing, even if we come at some cost of sensitivity. Now it turns out at Georgia Tech, we're using something that has a turnaround time of about a day. And because we're using PCR, we our own standards look at almost at 100% sensitivity. We think they're about 97% and specificity approaching 100%. These contour lines indicate a simulation of an SER-like model with entry testing with a low sensitivity and high sensitivity test. The biggest factor here is if we can use non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce r naught, then even if our tests are not as frequent, we get a lot of synergistic benefit. As you can see in a population of 15,000, these contour lines suggest that even testing weekly, if we can use masks and other forms of interventions, could mean that we're at hundreds of cases as opposed to thousands of cases. And you can see how rapidly the contact, uh, these uh, contour lines go up as R0 increases, right, for the same level of testing. So it's not a silver bullet, it's synergistic, but speed matters. This is in fact what we've tried to do here at the Institute. This is a team effort, more than 30 individuals, including process engineers, logistics people, people working in the laboratory, which has led to an in-house effort that is currently under FDA review for emergency youth authorization and approval. We're using it locally, but to use it more broadly, we have to get this EUA approved. And I won't go through all the details, but in essence, what happens is that, maybe I'll just sit on the slide for a moment, individuals go to a site and get tested, donate a saliva sample. So it's using a saliva sample, which is non-invasive. The testing takes less than five minutes. It's self-administered. It's sent off to processing and a day later, typically it comes back. And I just wanna kind of go through the arc of what happened. Students came back to campus. We've had over 7,500 who live and learn on campus and over 10 to 12,000 probably, including staff and faculty are regularly circulating on campus. As students came back, we had already imagined that we were going to get imported cases, but because of the dense environment and frankly, because of clusters and gatherings, the rates went up to a 4% positivity rate, which may seem low, when compared to other rates of symptomatic testing, but this is with asymptomatic testing. We were very concerned, but the good news was that we were able to rapidly identify these individuals, often in clusters, reinforce our testing, focusing on those areas in which there were positive cases, and drive down positivity to below 1% in early September. And I just want to point out we've had one month plus of sustained less than 1% positivity testing 1,500 to 2,000 individuals five days a week, though the capacity is even beyond that, okay? So it's just hopefully pointing out the value of viral testing, not just as a passive measure, but a form of mitigation when used at scale. In doing so, I wanna give a couple lessons that I think may be of general interest, although they reflect our campus, we should expect heterogeneity, meaning when we analyze the variation, particularly in this peak period, about 75% of the cases were attributable to about a quarter of the, what are called Greek houses. For those of you not familiar with US campus life, there are these fraternity houses where essentially high density living environments where essentially sleeping and even just sort of doing basic activities like eating is very hard to do unless you're in a group. So it reflects a high density living environment. In dorms, it's not as high density, but still we found a subset of these resonances were attributable to most of the cases. A lot of that is stochastic, an introduction followed by spread. The other issue is that large gatherings remain problematic. There were absolutely large gatherings, both parties and other kinds of gatherings that led to spread. The danger there, of course, is that there's a higher chance someone has COVID-19. More potential interaction, scales with N squared, and it's harder to do contact tracing. And just to point out, because Jorge mentioned this, 
We have a tool, COVID-19 risk.biosci.ga.tech.au, that provides county level estimates of the probability that one or more individuals may have COVID-19 in groups of different sizes that you can then enter and you can choose a bias, essentially a reporting rate or what we call an ascertainment bias because most cases are not documented. So again, that's another issue that we certainly saw here, unfortunately in action at the beginning. The other thing I wanna point out is that there's been some blame of, of individuals who actually contract COVID-19. It's not all about parties. Part of this is a reflection simply of how people live. Household transmission is real. We found that these kind of dorm rooms, which we have been concerned about from the outset, double rooms, increase the risk that an individual might get COVID-19 by sevenfold, meaning one person gets in the double room, it's highly likely the next person gets it. And you can see why household transmission, where it isn't possible to have extended periods where you're not wearing a mask and, and are physically distancing, could lead to increased spread. Okay. So I just wanted to go over that quickly, just as really a point, I know it's quite applied, but this idea that viral testing is not just there to tell us the state of affairs that might then inform us about other interventions, but actually viral testing is itself a potential form of mitigation. Now I wanna talk about another idea also related to testing, which is testing for antibodies, which in our view can also be in a, a form of mitigation and like viral testing remains underutilized. Any questions at this stage or should I keep moving ahead? I think I think uh, I think we are fine. Maybe uh, you you go ahead. And That's if there are questions, I uh, yeah, please. So early on, and this is about May of this year, we made a proposal for what we term shield immunity. The idea is that if one could test for virus and antibodies and find individuals who had been infected but are no longer shedding virus or even uh, PCR positive, which may not mean mean infectious virus, but maybe just remnants of virus those individuals, if they could increase their interactions, they could dilute potentially risky interactions between susceptible and infectious individuals. And we call this shielding. In other words, recovered individuals preferentially interacting with susceptible and independent with infectious individuals, both of those are not going to lead to a new transmission event and therefore would potentially reduce, act as a negative feedback on spread. In other words, if there are individuals who have unknown status, the response has often been to cut off all interactions, but our hope here is that by identifying individuals who are recovered, that could lead to preferential interactions with recovered individuals. Therefore, personalizing the response rather than leading to these en masse lockdowns. In other words, lockdowns for everybody. And again, the scale and type of testing matters. PCR provides the snapshot. Are you shedding virus now? Are you infectious now? Serological testing provides a history have you been infected recently or in the past? And yes, there are rare examples of second infections, but given the many millions of cases, the very small number of reinfections suggest that recovery for the most part implies immunity. The duration is still unknown, but I think there is some confidence at least we're talking six to eight months at least as being a baseline. And the farther we go out without seeing these reinfections, the more confidence we have that the bulk of people will continue to be immune at least over that time scale. SARS-1 and MERS also suggest multi-year uh, immunity. Of course, seasonal beta coronaviruses, the expectation had only been on the order of months. We can translate this idea in terms of a very simple ordinary differential equation model where we have changes in susceptible, infectious, and recovered, in which instead of this bilinear term, beta SI, the dilution, if we actually explicitly write down the force of infection, shows up in the denominator, where alpha is the, essentially the shielding strength. And if individuals don't change their behavior, this reverts back to the classic SIR model. But as individuals who recover increase their interactions, you can see that this reduces the force of infection, diluting out those interactions. Here then is the epidemic size in these kind of models as a function of shield strength with different levels, uh, different mechanistic models. This is the herd immunity threshold for this particular uh, model where R0 is three. And the point is that you can have epidemic sizes that stop well below that of herd immunity as long as individuals uh, 
engage in these substitutable interactions. But of course, this is a very simple model. In reality, COVID-19 is more complicated. It's been hard to control in part because individuals who are exposed may go through an asymptomatic but nonetheless infectious stage. And some individuals may become symptomatic. And I, as you know, there's also pre-symptomatic transition between asymptomatic and symptomatic. Here I'm using asymptomatic as people who have subclinical or, or mild cases that would not be identified or classified as symptomatic. Amongst those symptomatic individuals, some may be hospitalized, but subcritical, some may be critical. And obviously the, the majority of folks recover. Unfortunately, many people, uh, as I said before, somewhere between 0.5 and 1% uh, of these infections end up being fatal. So we took this idea of shield immunity and applied it to this more complicated case and found Again, a take home here is that these effects are often synergistic. Here I'm looking, you're seeing a contour map with shielding and social distancing. The key takeaway here within these contour maps is that if you have a fixed level of shielding, we can do more if we use it synergistically with social distancing. In other words, that instead of having severe social distancing, you can use some social distancing and some shielding to lead to the same level of reduction in total fatalities. So the point here is that less intense social distancing and shielding could have population-wide benefits. We've also evaluated the feasibility uh, of this, adapting these SAR-like models to include the analytic features of serological tests, including false negatives and false positives. And the idea here is we take these SAR-like structures, but then distinguish between test negative and test positive individuals and obviously what we want are these true positives, recovered individuals who we identify and who are effectively shielding. What we don't want are individuals who are susceptible, exposed and have false positive, and then they increase their interactions. Okay? And the key takeaway here is that insofar as we minimize these false positives with the use of uh, highly specific tests, then this kind of strategy can still be effective. And that's what I'm showing here that if we have this relaxation of social distancing and test capacity, what we want is on the one hand, reduction in fatalities. This is cumulative deaths, so blue is good, fewer fatalities, but also more people released from these severe social distancing. So we're trying to balance here public health and socioeconomic outcomes. And the point is that some relaxation of social distancing, as long as we have sufficient tests, can be useful on both the public health and the socioeconomic side, even with imperfect tests. Early antibody tests were not good enough, but some of the recent tests are now good enough that we think that this is now feasible and we're working on trying to make this work in practice. Now, frankly, in the United States, our hope had been early in March through May that this could be a national policy. For various reasons, we don't have confidence this can be a national policy and are working on localized pilots. And the focus of most of our pilot work has to do with nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Part of the reason is that, at least in Georgia and many states, a large fraction of fatalities are happening in nursing homes, even if only a small fraction of the cases are happening in nursing homes. This was as of mid-September, 40% of fatalities in nursing homes. And as you can see, we had less than 5% of the cases, right? So there's a disproportionate effect. And the advantage here is that we're working on shield immunity protocols to essentially use consistent cohorting or staffing to try to ensure that individuals who recover, particularly healthcare workers, by strategically redeploying who they interact with, that can make both residents and staff safer. And unfortunately, we're at a point where there are enough healthcare workers who have recovered that we think this is now feasible. So that's what we're working on now, trying to take these population views and use them strategically in particular settings to reduce these strong significant impacts of COVID-19, particularly in vulnerable individuals. So I know this has been a, a kind of a highlight tour, but I wanted to get those two ideas out. And now I'll go in depth into a third part, which is trying to use mathematical models to inform disease dependent policies, trying to get individualized policies rather than en masse policies. And this is joint work with Michael Hochberg at Montpellier, Yorai Wardi, 
who's a control theorist here at Georgia Tech, and two students who are really leading uh, the lead analytic work, Juan Lin Lee, who's in the QBIOS program, and Shashwat Shivam from the ECE program, both at Georgia Tech. So again, let me go back now to these SER-like models and begin to unpack them. If we take a look at SER-like models, the force of infection is not just dependent on how many individuals we have, but by their contact rates, what they're doing. So if we now write down an SEIR model, you see that the force of infection depends on these states, but again, as I said, these contact rates where exposed individuals become infectious, infectious individuals recover most of the time, but not always. Let me now write again the force of infection, which I mentioned before in the context of R-naught, but I'll write now here because it's the force of infection that we'd like to try and modulate. The force of infection is the product of the contact rate of infectious individuals times the probability that interaction is with a susceptible individual times the probability that the event leads to an infection. And if we write this down, you can see that if we have a contact rate of infectious individuals, the probability that they'll interact with the susceptible individuals is not just the ratio where the fraction of people are susceptible, but if people are doing different things, we have to weight it by their contact rate. So that's why we have the CSS divided by this sum of individuals times their contact rates. And then finally, if there is that interaction, there's the probability that it leads to a new infection. Okay. So it's influenced by the contact rates. And what we're trying to do here is building a control policy that would modulate or direct people to act differently depending on their test status, right? Whether or not they're infectious or recovered or neither. Okay, hopefully that setup is clear. To do that, we're gonna use an optimal control framework where we're gonna to try to make these state-specific contact rates and try to minimize a combination of public health costs and socioeconomic costs. And obviously, this is gonna be a balance. We're gonna to have to modulate by the infected levels and fatalities, and the socioeconomic costs will be quantified in terms of the total rate of interaction. So if less people are interacting, that comes at a cost. And also if we shift what people do, that comes at a cost. These weights are important. And this goes back to the notion of dichotomous outcomes that I talked about at the outset. If we focus on only W1, we're gonna to lead to lockdowns. That's all we're gonna care about. If we do W2, we're gonna say open up, but that's gonna come at a severe public health cost. So we're gonna to try to evaluate where we need to optimize for both. In some sense, there's a tension between things that might uh, benefit public health or those that might ostensibly benefit our socioeconomic uh, components. Okay, so then the problem is to specify an optimal control policy. But an optimal control policy tells us when people should change behavior. You can imagine that we solve this problem, we run it through our dynamic model, we get these different costs and we try to find an optimal policy. But as Dylan Morris and colleagues show, these can be fragile. If we misspecify our parameters, we misestimate, misestimate the state or even the qualitative uh, features of the epidemic, we could be exponentially wrong. Nonetheless, it was interesting to see what came out of this policy. What did the policy tell us? This is a result of this optimal control policy uh, framework. And I want to point out that this blue is what recovered individuals should do. The red is what infectious individuals should do. And the S denotes what both susceptible and also, ex frankly, exposed individuals do, because we can't tell yet that they're exposed. Uh, if we did, then we'd lump them in with the I category. What the policy says, and this is at 60 days we turn on the policy, it says recovered individuals should increase their activity as much as is possible and infectious individuals should decrease their activity as much as is possible. In other words, the optimal control framework discovers isolation and also discovers shield immunity without having those input into it. It's also interesting that later on it says that we should relax the lockdown and susceptible individuals should return to business as usual. 
So it tells us that what we're gonna to try to do in some ways is instead of looking for an optimal control policy, maybe what we should do is look for a feedback policy that takes these extremal features, isolation and shielding, but then tries to find a state rather than a time where we should emerge from lockdown for susceptible individuals. So that's going to be our feedback objective. So we're going to switch from this optimal framework to a feedback control objective. So rather than finding a time, we're going to find a system dependent change to change the CS, not as a function of time, but as a function of the state. And hopefully I'll show that next in the next slide. But uh, Joshua, can I ask a question just to see whether my intuition is correct? Yeah. In, in the previous uh, slide where uh, the number of susceptibles, that's right. So I guess that then uh, the number of uh, the, 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 the interaction of in, the, in the susceptible uh, state is increasing is because the, the infection is dying out, right? So the susceptibles cannot be infected anymore. So that's why they, 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 they go back to normal. Actually. Correct, that's, that's precisely right. So rather than saying that should happen at time 240 days, sure. your intuition is right. What we're trying to find is there is position in state space, which has to do with low risk, that it's safe enough to let susceptible individuals, if we were to figure out who's susceptible, who's infected and recovered, to resume activity depending on the state of the epidemic rather yeah. than the time. So it's exactly what we're trying to do. Your intuition mm -hmm. is spot on. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So this is in fact what we're trying to do. We take our state specific policies, put them into our SEIR model, and then here's where the testing comes into play try to measure the state of the epidemic via viral testing and serological testing, and then try to identify a control policy to modulate what these state-specific rates should be, okay? And what we're going to do is impose that ice, infectious individuals, yes, should isolate. Recovered individuals should increase their activity as much as is possible due to shielding. The question has to do with what about everyone else? So this then is the result of what everyone else should do. Let me orient you here to explain the result. These curves, these black curves, denote the trajectories in phase space. The x-axis is the infected fraction. The y-axis is the recovered fraction. The, you see 16 of these, which means up top, testing and isolation is relatively ineffective as we go down in these rows. And as we move across in the columns, the efficiency of our shielding increases. So let's focus, first of all, for a fixed level of shielding. You can see that when we have ineffective isolation, we have to sit for a longer period in this gray zone where it's locked down. And only when we get here a higher level of recovered individuals up into nearly 20% can the susceptible population essentially go back to normal. However, the more that we have shielding, you see that this position drops down and only actually after about 10%, we can release from lockdown. What's notable is that when we have efficient testing and isolation, you'll notice here, this is at 5% or even 4%. The more efficient we are at isolating, in fact, we may not ever need to go to lockdown because we're able to keep the fraction of infected so low so as long as there's a sufficient number of recovered individuals and a small number of infectious individuals, we can reopen. So that really is the takeaway, that effective in testing and isolation may enable an earlier switch from lockdown to reopening. In other words, focusing the stay-at-home orders on those who are sick rather than doing population-wide lockdowns. But this requires large-scale testing. Okay? It comes with a cost. We have to invest in large-scale testing, understanding where we are is in the state of the epidemic in order to then not impose population-wide lockdowns. Okay. So hopefully that takes us through a kind of a whirlwind tour. I've tried to do this in abbreviated time. I know it's the end of your day. And I've tried to communicate three ideas one of which is that large-scale testing for viral presence can be part of mitigation strategies. And the concept is simple, and I think it's important in COVID-19 to recognize that if we can have simple but actionable ideas, they may actually turn into policy. And the idea here is simply that if we test enough, 
we can pull people out of this infectious pool and move them into the removed category rather than waiting for them to recover, stopping chains of transmission before they start. Likewise, I've talked about serological testing. It can be useful to understand the denominator. In other words, how many people have in fact been infected, but I think we can use it more aggressively if we're able to try to identify recovered individuals and particularly in circumstances like healthcare settings, this may be used to shield vulnerable individuals, an idea that's also shown up in pertussis and cocooning to protect those individuals from infection and severe effects. And finally, I've tried to merge these ideas together on this last section, showing the value of testing in terms of individualizing policies, essentially by trying to use a control theoretic framework, learning lessons from optimal control, but then applying them in feedback control. If we test enough, it may be possible not to impose large scale lockdowns, but using large scale testing to return to business, but not as usual. And with that, again, just want to thank the team uh, that has made all this work possible. And since hopefully I haven't taken up too much time, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, Jorge? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Joshua, th thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting talk. It, it has been actually very illuminating for me. And I must say that. Uh, even when uh, sometimes uh, one thinks that uh, compartmental models ha have their limitations, it, 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 it is clear uh, in your talk that uh, you can get very, uh, very brilliant and very useful ideas out of them, actually. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, colleagues, do you have uh, any questions? I think, so let me Luis put here. Question. Ah, Luis, uh, come on, Luis, uh, go ahead. So uh, I th thank you very much for the for the talk. Really, very very illuminating, as Isaac said. I have two questions. So the first one is, what about the cost of testing? So you spoke about two different tests. What about I mean, how much does each one cost in whatever currency? And the second question is, what about reinfections? So yeah. now there is a discussion whether I mean uh, people can or not be reinfected. Let me answer, I'll try to answer both questions. I think with the question, at least in the United States, and I, I recognize this is a United States answer, but with respect to our test at Georgia Tech, I can just give you that example. As I spoke with the folks who lead the lab side, we do pool testing. So we take five tests and pool them together. And only if one of those five is positive, do we move to another diagnostic test. But even that test costs the same amount. It costs mm -hmm. less than $10 for a pool test. A cup of coffee, right? Okay. Un, un, un café, right? Sure. Like, not even a fancy one, right? just yeah. a cheap one. Now, the question is, when you scale that up, the logistics actually become limiting. Yes, we have to have the infrastructure. But let me point out, and this is a critique of the United States response. There's recently been a discussion how Fauci and others pushed for the $9 billion worth of funds to be used for testing and were rebuffed. If I take a $2 test just as a kind of a, as a benchmark, I get that there are all these ancillary costs. We have 330 million people in the United States, right? You could do 15 weeks of testing for everyone. I mean, that's not, obviously we don't need to do that, but you could use it at much larger scales and it wouldn't, be that expensive. The cost of having the infection is much worse. Now, there are other issues there. There are rapid tests too that are coming to market. So I just don't think we have not invested in testing, not because of the cost, the financial cost, but I'll be frank, I think it's because people have not wanted to look bad. They don't like the idea that it might make them look bad. This mm -hmm. has been stupid. Yeah. <clears throat> testing is not just a means of passive getting a passive sense, we should be using it actively. With respect to the antibody test, there have been issues there because to take an antibody test is often involved phlebotomy, a, a blood draw, you need a physician, that's longer, but there are now increasing these dried blood spot tests, which can also be done essentially with a prick, a finger stick, and so that also is driving down costs. But again, in that case, we're getting to a point where I think 
we need to show pilot cases. Mm -hmm. For the most part, my issue has been that if we wait for national policies, we could wait forever. Mm -hmm. We need to actually mm -hmm. do things at local scales, show that they work, and then hope other people adopt. With respect to your second question, uh, having to do with immunity. From the outset in our shield immunity paper, we said this could still be effective as long as the duration of effective immunity is six months or longer. We actually evaluated that yeah. in the supplemental. You are right to say that we've seen a few cases of second infections. Keep in mind that in the United States alone, I mean, the number of infections, I believe we've passed 7 million at this mm -hmm. stage. And mm -hmm. if we think the ascertainment bias is five yeah. times that, this may be tens of millions of cases. A few cases, we're talking about rare televents on the order of six to eight months. So I, I think we should operate that it is giving us immunity. We don't know how long. We don't know if the second infection two to three years from now may not be, maybe it could be worse. We don't know. There's lots of things we don't know, but thus far it seems to behave like what we expect. Protective immunity over many months, maybe a year or more, but it's buying us a lot of time for those who've been infected, but we're not using that information. So we're not using any of that right now to take any action. So I guess that would be my broad answer to both your questions. Hopefully that is informative. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Luis, for, uh, Luis, for the for the question. Uh, colleagues, uh, more questions, please. Just unmute your microphones. Adam Castro. Adam Castro, yes, sorry. You have a question. Please go ahead, Adam. Uh, thank you. Uh, OK, I, I try to explain myself in English. Si vos quieres preguntar en español, está bien, porque entiendo. Oh, thank you. Ok, lo voy a hacer en español para que sea más fácil. Pero, eh, pero lento, despacio. Sí, yeah. <laughs> Estoy escuchando okay. porque el volumen hay un problema. Sí. I, I, I have to, to wrote it down. Uh, uh, analysis you provide support the idea that testing for COVID-19, even in a population with low positivity radio, uh, um, by removing infected individuals, so you, we can reduce propagation. I, I'm a right. Then, uh, can someone, can uh, alguien puede repetir? It, it's very hard for me to hear this question. It's just having a... Yeah, for me as well. Jorge, can, can you... Oh, bueno, voy a, aquí, voy a traducir lo que puso Adán. A ver, Adán me dice si, si traduzco correctamente. O quizás sería, Adán, si lo puedes decir en español. Muchas gracias, eh, doctor, doctor Velasco. Un honor. Sí, órale. Este, sí bueno, eh, entonces... Los datos dicen que nosotros re, eh, removemos infectados que están asintomáticos y es aunque sea muy bajo el índice o, o la proporción de, de positivos, la dinámica puede ser afectada grandemente. Eso nos da una ventana de oportunidad bastante importante. Pero esto nos lleva justamente a lo que preguntó el, el doctor Bennett hace un momento eh, acerca del costo. Pero yo quisiera llegar un paso más lejos a, a preguntar sobre eh, la posibilidad de un análisis costo-utilidad que pueda guiar a los decisores y que ya no sea una situación pues, de opinión o de filosofía acerca de las pruebas. Gracias. Ok, I don't know if that was a comment. Uh, it got to philosophy at the end and then maybe I... Maybe no, I, I think it was not a comment, but I think that it was in your seminar. But I think that the, what Adam was 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 uh, was asking at, at the beginning, he, he was just summarizing your results that uh, if you were moving uh, infected people, just doing te test it, that can uh, dramatically uh, uh, affect you know the number of, of infected. I mean, possibly. That's, that's, that's the right. Question is whether it, whether uh, uh, you can do a, a cost, uh, you know, a, a benefit cost analysis uh, as uh, you do in economy. To, to yeah. convince, you know, politicians to follow uh, your strategy. I, I think yeah. that was the, the question Adam was uh, trying to ask. Yeah, and I think you mentioned particularly the point of the asymptomatic focus. And this has been actually a real point of controversy, right? Because you raised this question, is it worthwhile to test for asymptomatic people? And I think if your tests are limited, then it's probably not effective. Because then what you should be using is following up on your positive cases 
and trying to increase the odds that you stop chains of transmission. Sure. And to do that effectively, you should test asymptomatic people, but asymptomatic people that you identify in the household or nearby or through contact tracing, right? So that's a more effective use of your limited resources. Once you have more resources, then we can really use it as a population-wide effect. And I think, again, that goes back to the question that was raised uh, by the earlier gentleman, uh, which was the cost structure. We've drawn down the brought down the cost so much because we've developed the technology at Georgia Tech that we can afford to do it at the population scale, right? So that I think has got to be the, and that's going to be where policy switches happen. Okay, th thank you, Joshua, for uh, an, an, uh, an Adam for the question. Next question is from uh, Fernando Saldaña. Fernando, uh, go ahead, please unmute your microphone and you can ask directly either in Spanish or in English. Eh, hola a todos, buenas eh, tardes. Muchas gracias al, al profesor Joshua por la charla. Uh, mi pregunta tiene que ver con, eh, bueno, también está relacionada con los costos. Eh, en particular, mi pregunta era, es un poco matemática acerca de, eh, de las posibles formas que puede tener el funcional de costo en el problema de control óptimo. Eh, y también si afecta mucho el, el tiempo en el que modelas eh, las intervenciones, porque tengo entendido que el tiempo final puede afectar la forma que tiene un control óptimo. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question, and I'll just uh, give my answer to say that you're absolutely right, that the choice of the final time is going to matter a lot. Mm -hmm. In fact, I hope what you saw in yeah. the initial, está bien si, si ¿Contesto en inglés o prefieres que trato a contestar en español? Voy a tratar de contestar. Yeah, I can actually understand English. English is okay. okay. Yeah, no, I know you can, but it's fun for me. Okay. Okay. Joshua, en español está bien. Vamos a probar. <laughs> Vamos a probar. Okay. Vos, vos notaste que al final del... Voy a hacer un reverse. Vos notaste acá, ves que este nivel de contact de los que todavía no eh, estaban infectados, está aumentado. Y la razón es porque estamos sí. usando este momento del tiempo final. Uh -huh. Y por eso decidimos convertir al problema de feedback control en vez de optimal control, que es, para nosotros es más importante uh, obtener eh, el momento en vez del tiempo, eh, como el día, que es mejor a uh, uh, para los que es, es, son, son susceptibles a cambiar su nivel de interactuar. Así, por eso, no sé si ese uh, ayuda un poquito, pero por eso es, es un problema de optimal control, porque necesitamos a, a poner un, un peso, un weight, al tiempo final. Y es un poco frágil. Y por eso convertimos también a, a este feedback control en vez de optimal control que nosotros pensamos que primero es, es, es práctico, podemos usarlo. Práctico, está bien. Práctico, sí. Y también es, um, es menos frágil en ese sentido. But you're right that this final time influence, particularly this, you sometimes see this, these lag effects near the end. But all, right. the, all the formulas, all the, we, you, we can, you can look at them in the, in the, um, supplementary information of the paper that are available we talk about the choice of the weighting functions and so on we and we have discussed there's some variation that you're going to get but i think the qualitative effect here at least to some extent robust to these choices but i'm happy to discuss it's very a good nice. question oh, okay well yeah thank you very much thank you fernando for the for the question uh, next one would be uh is uh saul diaz infante Saul, please, uh, if you unmute your microphone and ask directly either in Spanish or in, in English. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, voy a preguntar en español. ¿Está bien? Eh, bien, Joshua, eh, felicidades por tu trabajo. Recientemente leí tu trabajo de National Medical eh, sobre este de, de, de las políticas de SHIELD. Eh, es bien sabido, como dices, que las políticas de Open Loop, las de control óptimo, son muy frágiles porque uno asume que la dinámica es conocida y entonces, eh, de, de acuerdo a tus estimaciones sobre la dinámica, pues afecta muchísimo las políticas de, 
de control. Y todo mundo que hace algo de control quiere apostarle a las, a las políticas de feedback o las que también se le conocen como closed loop. Pero aquí este, yo quisiera preguntarte eh, sobre, la sobre los problemas numéricos al momento de resolver el problema de control. Me refiero, cuando uno mete más dimensión al problema de control, a veces se vuelve intracta, intratable. Entonces, la pregunta es, concreta es, es, ¿aquí en este nuevo modelo que están considerando pueden hacer estratificación y optimizar? ¿O solamente están considerando un modelo tres dimensiones? Yo creo que para tres dimensiones ya se complicaría, ya, al menos en mi vista. Ok, actually, now I lost you at the end because just when you got to your question, I understood everything to the question and then it got hard to hear. So you were talking about the numerical methods, but at the end, I just didn't understand the very last part of the question. Yes, the, my question is about the course of dimensionality or the problem. The curse of dimensionality. Okay, that's what I thought, yeah, that's what, right. Okay, so, right, so let me go back to, uh, and now you can see the limits. Now, that's why I didn't give my talk in Spanish because there's certain uh, words I don't understand. But with respect to this control policy, I'll just point out that um, there's certainly going to be a question of the qualitative stability of our decision process. So yes. we have a nonlinear dynamical system. All of the control stuff was done um, using these sort of Arduino step sizes, working with your Iwardi to kind of do the best practices. But I agree that we have not proven to ourselves or to others that this would be robust. If, for example, we took this entire model structure and opened it up in the same way that we opened up our asymptomatic and symptomatic routes and we really had a larger state space if that's what you're getting at. Now maybe I'm misinterpreting your question. Um, we've certainly shown within this model context it can be more robust and we actually show that it's robust by slightly changing the timing. So in the paper we actually show that if we mistimed the optimal control we have a very bad outcome but if we mistimed a little bit our feedback control we're okay. So we can misspecify the state and still be okay. But if you're, you're, you're just right that if we have the wrong model, um, we may be off in other means. And I, I agree with that in some level. I'm not sure what to do with that. I still find that some parts of this answer f I find appealing because it has recapitulated some of what we think we know on isolation, some of what we know on shield immunity. And it seems to be finding this interesting switching point when essentially the force of infection gets low enough because there are enough recovered people and there are few enough infected people. So in that sense, it seems sensible, but I can't guarantee it mathematically. Okay. That's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, another question, please. Uh, you, be, you will see uh, feasible attack the problem with stratification, with feedback control? I'm not even understanding now that with, with yes, what stratification it? according to age or stratification according to race. Ah, stratification, right. Yeah, so in the in the shield immunity paper, we stratified by age. We haven't done that kind of work here. We haven't actually demonstrated yet that this next level. I mean, the, the problem is that as soon as you open up the doors to stratification, it never stops. And our point, let me go back to something that was said at the very outset of your comments. Okay. We're using, in other cases, we've done network models and we're working on more complicated models. But let me just, because we've had experience at Georgia Tech in trying to build models of this campus. And what is the value of this simple model? Let me make an analogy. We know that when you fly a plane, that F equals MA and there's gravity, but there's no dial in front of you when you're flying a plane that says F equals MA. You can't use that. Of course, it's built in everywhere. So the thing that I view in these models is that they are guides for engineering action. Okay. So my worry is that once we start to make these guides to policy too complicated, we open up a new critique. Oh, well, it's very specific based on your choices. And now it's not relevant to our case. So for example, in that viral testing, in order to convince my colleagues and ourselves that testing should be increased scale, we decided rather than trying to, to specify every feature of our campus, which other people did, yeah, yeah. we simply said, look, if you can compete with the recovery time, we have a chance. And to compete, we can't wait and test 200 people as other 
universities were doing, we have to test basically everyone every week. We have to have a chance of competing with the recovery period. If I were then to say, now we need a model for the parties and the rooms, and people have done that, and all I can say is that those will also be wrong, and you'll have confidence intervals that are this big, and the same conclusion will be reached, that we just need a lot of testing. And you won't know some of the things from the outset. So for example, all these mean field models are good because they give you the theme, but we haven't done that in practice. If we had just treated our campus like a mean field model, we wouldn't have been as effective. Why? We see a cluster. In our mean field model, we shouldn't have clusters. So we should ignore it and just keep testing everyone at the same rate. That would be stupid. Instead, what we did is saw a cluster of cases and then worked intensively to increase testing in that closer and in adjacent houses. And that was much more effective. In fact, the clustering of cases, the non-homogeneity makes it worse at some level because we don't know where it's going to pop up and it'll get bad, but it makes it better for control because they're clustered and we can actually control and target our work. So I guess maybe that's my long way of saying that I view these models, I take them seriously, but not absolutely literally because they are meant to guide then the engineering action. And if we're trying to make the world be exactly like our model, we'll miss the chance to do something effective when it comes in practice. So I, maybe that's a philosophical question or answer to your question, but it's, it's one that I actually believe in now, seeing this unfold in practice. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saul, uh, for the question. Uh, any, any other questions, uh, colleagues? Um, if not, uh, yes, Alan? Yes, I, I will talk in English because I don't have my best. Uh, what do you think about, uh, you have this uh, middle field model and then you translate it to an agent based model and make um, um, sensitivity analysis. Yeah. Do you think there a lot of information is lost in, in this transla translation. Okay, well, let me, we, we have already doing some of that in different ways. So in earlier work and, and uh, as Ore knows, we looked, we'd worked before in Ebola and translated these mean field like models into stochastic models where one of the main takeaways is that the confidence you have in confidence intervals goes down, right? So there's oftentimes we, we're fitting models to data using mean field, we get good fits, and we have a false sense of confidence about parameter estimates. So I think one of the main takeaways is that it makes our certainty less certain. With respect to the action, when we've translated these, for example, the shield immunity case, and it's not done yet, but one of the big things we knew is that we aren't going to, at least at the start, be able to impose this at the population scale. We might have a particular location with hundreds of individuals. So we started to build a network model. And then the question is, how do we do shield or translate these ideals to a network? We have to take the same idea, but rewire edges rather than try to just reduce all activity. And we're seeing some of the same effects, but it is another step, right? It, it's itself <laughs> its own challenge. So we're trying to get to that point where we're giving policy at the level of staffing and of individual behavior, which again is why I think a healthcare setting is a good one. People are likely to follow the rules. There's a clear benefit. Uh, and it's also one that we can't then apply just everyone change their rate at some fixed level. We actually have to tell people who to interact with depending on test status. So that's where we're going. Maybe I, you know, you can look online, hopefully in weeks or months, we'll have something like that online to share. Gracias a Adán por la pregunta. Eh, colegas, quizás la última pregunta, si hay una, alguna, una preguntita más. Y si no, eh, pues eh, Joshua, yo soy un poquito chap, chap, chapado a la antigua, como se dice en, en España. Me gusta que eh, aplaudir, eh, aunque sí. Entonces, pediría a los colegas que activen los micrófonos y aplaudimos a Joshua por esta fantástica charla, por favor. Muchas gracias.
y gracias a ustedes por, por las, por las preguntas y también por tus, eh, su paciencia con mi español. Gracias, mil gracias. Muchas gracias, Joshua. Gracias a ti, Joshua. Gracias, gracias colegas. Eh, un pequeño anuncio. Eh, la semana que viene no hay seminario, ahora pasamos a, a la, a la, a la, al, al, al formato regular que era, es cada 15 días. Creo que nos quedan, eh, Jorge, si no más recuerdo, dos, dos o tres ponentes. Dos, más. Mario Santana y Jonathan Tucho. No, y a, y a, y a Kino, no. Eh, se me olvida no, 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 ahora. Pero bueno. Que, creo que son tres más, sí, pero va, va a ser ahora cada 15 días. Bueno, muchas okay. gracias a todos. Gracias. Eh, buenas tardes y una vez más, eh, Joshua, muchas gracias por este gracias, fantástico seminario. Estamos Hasta en luego. contacto. Sí, claro. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.